This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Joanna Albala. I'm the manager of the science education program at Lawrence Livermore Lab. And I am happy to welcome you to Science on Saturday, which is brought to you in conjunction with the Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District. And I hope you enjoyed our little sneak peek, first look inside the laboratory. And now I have to give you some housekeeping rules. So in case of an emergency, note where the exits are in the theater. And if there is a reason to evacuate the theater, the ushers will escort you out to the front of the building safely. Also, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And note that at the very end of the presentation, we'll take questions. So we'd like everyone to remain seated to um, be able to hear the questions uh, given to our presenters. And at the very end, if you don't get your question answered, feel free to come up after the show and speak with our scientists. So this year, we have a really exciting series this February for Science on Saturday. It's our Women in STEM presentations. So every Saturday, we are going to give you a presentation in STEM, science, technology, engineering, or math. And so today, we kick off this series with science. And what better way than to talk about this city's favorite element, Livermorium. So Dr. Dawn Shaughnessy is a group leader in nuclear and radiochemistry at the laboratory, and she's been there since 2002. And she is part of a very large team that has discovered Livermorium as well as several other elements. She holds her PhD in chemistry from UC Berkeley. Helping her bring the science to life today is Ms. Kathy Wong, who is a science teacher at Doherty Valley High School in San Ramon. She teaches a variety of biology courses there, and she's been there for the last seven years. She, too, has a degree in chemistry. Her undergraduate degree is from UCLA, and she has her master's in teaching uh, from UC Irvine. So without further ado, I'd like to bring out Dr. Dawn Shaughnessy and Ms. Kathy Wang. Let's welcome them. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for spending part of your Saturday with us. I am Dawn Shaughnessy, and I'm a nuclear chemist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And I want to tell you how I got into science very quickly. I have been interested in all things science since I was a little kid, and that's when the first Star Wars opened up. That's how long ago we're talking. And at first I had an electronics kit, and I wanted to be an engineer, and I played with that for quite a while. And then I moved to a microscope, and I wanted to learn about biology, and even wanted to be a doctor. And then finally I got a chemistry set, and that's when I was hooked forever. Because in chemistry, we can take two things that are completely different and mix them together and come up with a brand new compound. Um, my name is Kathy, and I became a science teacher because I really enjoy uh, getting kids excited about the little things in life. So in my class, we go over DNA, proteins, molecules, and see how the little actions that these molecules play can really affect how our environment is and how health is. So thanks. Thank you. So with that, we'll get started. Today, I'm going to talk about the following topics up here. First, I'm going to describe to you what elements are and go over the periodic table, something that you're going to see quite a bit in this presentation. And then I'm going to talk to you about how we've made new elements and how we've given them names. And then finally, because I am a chemist, I'm going to talk about the chemistry of the heavy elements. So what are elements? Well, everything you see is made up of elements. And some of them you know already. You've probably referred to water as H2O, and that means water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen together. Thank you. And the air that you breathe, which is made up of oxygen gas, but also nitrogen and argon and different gases. And then we have things that make up the Earth itself, like sand, which is made out of silicon and oxygen, the same silicon that goes into making semiconductors down in Silicon Valley, which is why it got that name. And then finally, there's you, people, which are the most complex mix of elements that there are. You are made up of a variety of elements, carbon, oxygen, even silicon, and even metals like iron and aluminum, and so on. 
So this is the periodic table of elements, which is a roadmap for chemists that lists all the elements that we know about, which right now go from 1 to 118, shown here in the lower right-hand corner in the circle. Now, most periodic tables show at least a few things the same. For instance, they always have a number for each element. In, this one is in the upper left-hand corner. There's also a symbol for each element, and that's a shorthand way for us to list chemicals in a fast method. And then there's the name of the element as well. Now, this table also has some color coding, and what each color represents here is a group of elements that behave the same chemically. They have the same, in other words, they have the same physical properties as we go down these different groups. I also want to point out the two rows on the bottom. They're called the lanthanides and the actinides. They are part of the periodic table. They just form their own little series down at the bottom. I've also circled some of the elements I already talked about, such as hydrogen, which is number one in the upper left-hand corner, and there you see oxygen and silicon. 118 does not have a name yet, and we'll talk about that later on. So to talk about elements, we have to understand what's inside, and that would be an atom. An atom is the smallest form of matter that still retains the property of that element. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a real-world example. For instance, something everyone knows, a helium balloon. Now, helium is a gas. It's naturally occurring. We can't see it, but it comes in tanks, as you know, and you can fill balloons with it. But if we could look inside this balloon, we would see helium atoms, something that looks like this, swirling around one another. And in fact, we would see a lot of helium atoms on the order of 10 to the 23rd, which is a 10 with 23 zeros after it, just to make up one balloon. Now, if we could somehow look at an atom with our naked eye, which unfortunately we can't, we might see something that looks like this, a single atom of helium. Now, every atom has different parts. In the center is something called the nucleus, and every atom has one. The nucleus is made up of two different kinds of particles. There are protons, which have a positive charge, and neutrons, which are neutral, thus the name neutron. And together, those particles cluster up and form the nucleus. Orbiting around are small, negatively charged particles called electrons. Now, the number of protons is what determines what element we have. So for instance, in our helium example, every atom of helium inside our balloon, all 10 to the 23 of them, have two protons in their center. Helium is element number two. I gave you a sense of size here by listing how far across that helium atom is. And just to give you a sense of how many atoms you need to make up something, I would need roughly 4 million of these side by side to make up the width of one of your human hairs. So you can start to imagine that if we get to more complex things, the number of atoms required to make something that I can hold and see and touch. Here's where helium is in the periodic table, the upper right-hand corner. It's the first element in what's called the noble gas series, and that's that dark purple column all the way to the right. The noble gases are all gases in their natural state, and in fact, you probably know a lot about them already because if you've ever seen neon signs, those are made with one of these noble gases. They just all happen to emit in a different color. So let me give you a second real-world example to, so we can continue our discussion on atoms. How about gold, something we can actually see and, and feel and touch? If we take our nugget of gold here and we could cut it down and chop it down into smaller and smaller pieces, we would be left with one atom of gold. And that atom would have 79 protons in the middle. Gold is element 79. But how many atoms do we need to make something that looks like this gold nugget? Well, an Italian scientist named Amadeo Avogadro came up with a way to correlate the number of atoms to something you can actually hold. And we call this Avogadro's number. Now, if we use that and we calculate through, our one gram little tiny piece of gold would have three sextillion atoms, that's three with 21 zeros after it, of gold inside. That's a lot of atoms. And now if you scale that up to the large gold nugget I showed on the previous slide, that's getting to be an enormous number of atoms. Now, I wanted to bring this to your attention because as you start to look around you, and later when you pull out your cell phone to text everyone what a great talk you went to this morning, you're going to see how many atoms are in that cell phone. It's just mind-boggling. But keep this in mind, because later when we get to the heavy elements in the periodic table, we're going to be talking about one single atom at a time. Here's gold in the periodic table. It sits in what's known as the transition metals, this block of yellow elements. And these elements typically exist in a metallic state in their natural form. 
In addition to gold, some of its neighbors in this area are silver, copper, platinum, even iron and nickel. So things that you use to make uh, steel and buildings and jewelry and indeed your electronic components as well. So how did the periodic table come into being? Well, as far back as even the ancient Greeks, they were able to look around and see that the Earth was made up of different things. And they started thinking about how to categorize that. But if we skip all the way to the 1700s, Antoine Lavoisier wrote what's considered the first modern, in quotes, modern day chemistry textbook. And what he did is he took the elements that were known at the time, and there were 33 of them, and he listed them by their physical properties. In other words, did it look like a metal? Or was it a gas? Or did it make a salt? But then in the 1800s, an English chemist named John Newlands did something a little bit different. And he took what was then the 62 known elements, and instead of assigning them a physical property, he listed them in order of their mass, starting with hydrogen, number one, the lightest element, and just marching up based on how heavy they were. When he did that, something really amazing happened. There were chemical properties that started to repeat themselves in the periodic table at regular intervals. In fact, every eight elements, he noticed that the properties were starting to repeat. So this meant that nature had already categorized elements for us in a way, and it was just up to the chemist to figure out how to list them. Then Dmitry Mendeleev made what's really the basis of our modern day periodic table. He too listed elements by weight, but when he did this, he realized that because these chemical properties continually repeat themselves, there were elements that were missing. In other words, when he listed all of them out, just because of the chemical properties of these elements, there were ones that hadn't been discovered yet. And it started the search for unknown chemical elements. Now, the last real revolution in the periodic table came about in 1945, when Glenn Seaborg, who was a very famous nuclear chemist and a Nobel Prize winner from UC Berkeley, looked at the periodic table. And if you remember, I pointed out this lanthanide and actinide series down at the bottom here earlier. The actinides in that red square didn't used to sit down there. They used to be part of the main body of the periodic table and were the seventh and final row. But here's the problem that Dr. Seaborg realized is the chemistry of those actinides did not match up with the chemistry of the transition metals right above them. But because we knew by this time that chemistry kept repeating itself, it became obvious to him that that series of elements needed to sit below the lanthanides and be its own set of elements. When he did that, the chemistry all lined up again. But it actually also started looking for heavy elements, because now you see the actinides at this time were only half filled. That meant that there were at least seven more elements or more that could be discovered. And who knew then how much farther we could go beyond that? So in the late 60s, we get to this periodic table, which ends at element 104, rather 40. So Glenn Seaborg and his team took uranium, the last naturally occurring element on the bottom, and they put it in some early nuclear reactors and used those neutrons, that same particles I told you about, to try and make man-made elements in the laboratory. And they were very successful, and they were able to march along the actinides and even get all the way up to rather 40 and 104. But there was a problem. These elements are all radioactive. And what that means is that they don't stick around for too long. So even though they could be made in a lab, it was getting more and more difficult to detect them. So before I answer the question of how much farther can the periodic table go, let me take a moment and tell you what radioactivity is so you understand the challenge that these chemists had. So first, let me explain what an isotope is. Isotopes are all the same element but with different numbers of neutrons in their nucleus. They all chemically behave the same. For instance, here's hydrogen element number one, and as I told you, hydrogen has one proton in it. Now, if I add a neutron in, it's still chemically hydrogen because I have that one proton. But now I have an isotope called deuterium, which is a naturally occurring isotope. But if I add a second neutron in, now I have three particles in the nucleus, and I have a problem. Protons and neutrons like to have certain numbers in the nucleus. They mostly like to be in pairs, and they really like to have even numbers. My isotope of hydrogen called tritium with the two neutrons has three particles, which makes it unstable. 
In order to get more stable, the nucleus literally spits out the particle it doesn't want, and that is what we call radioactive decay. So later we're going to show you a little more about radioactivity, but for now I just want to explain that what's happening is a nucleus is emitting particles in order to try and get a number of protons and neutrons that it's more comfortable with. Now sometimes it emits several particles, like in the case on the left of our plutonium. Plutonium emits a helium nucleus and becomes uranium because, again, the number of protons has changed here, so we're actually changing the identity of the element during our radioactive decay. Likewise, that's our tritium on the right. Tritium will emit a small electron and, in doing, convert one of its neutrons to a proton, which it likes much better. But we now have two protons, which is element number two, helium. So in the course of radioactive decay, we're actually doing what's called transmutation. We are changing the identity of one element to another. And this happens with a certain time called the half-life. So if I have element yellow here at the bottom, and let's say it's unstable and it wants to undergo radioactive decay, the time it takes for half of my elements to decay and become purple elements is called the half-life. But I'm still left with radioactive yellow elements. So another half-life means half of those are decaying to purple elements, and so on and so on until I'm eventually left with a sample that's almost entirely element purple with none of element yellow left. Now, half-lives vary. Some are as long as the age of the Earth and are billions of years, and some, as you'll see later, are less than a second. Now, some naturally occurring elements are radioactive, like technetium, promethium, and polonium. And all of the elements, starting with polonium-84 through to uranium, which is the last naturally occurring element, are radioactive in and of themselves. That means the Earth itself has a small amount of radioactivity all the time. But don't worry, because the human body has actually evolved to be able to live with this low-level radioactive background. So I'm now going to turn the discussion over to Kathy, who's going to tell you more about radioactivity. Hi, everyone. All right. So. Um, what kind of materials emit radiation? So I'm going to ask you guys to, um, as an audience, I want you to be my Geiger counter. Um, I have five objects that you see every day in your household. And if you feel like this object emits lots of radiation, I want you to clap enthusiastically like someone famous just walked in, like really, really loud. Let's try that real quick. Yes? All right. Thank you. Now, if it's not so radioactive, maybe like liked, you know, not as enthusiastic. Okay, that's good. And if it doesn't emit any radiation, dead silence is good. That sounds good. All right, let's start with our first item here. So, what I have here is a smoke detector. Um, Geiger audience, does this object emit radiation? What do you guys think? Okay. All right, excellent. Um, it does have a little bit of a americium inside the smoke detector, but luckily the, the material um, has a half-light of like 436 years, so we're okay here. Okay, let's do our next item here. Um, it's kind of heavy. For you cat lovers up there, um, does cat litter emit radiation? What do you guys think? Kind of, a little bit. All right, so you are correct. There is a little bit of radiation emitted from cat litter. Uh, it's found in the clay that's, uh, that kitty litter is made out of. Um, all right, so we got that one correct. All right, our next item here is something that I'm sure all of you guys love. Uh, we got different types of nuts here, cashews, almonds. Do nuts have a little bit of radiation in there? What do you guys think? Okay. All right, yes, because a lot of the nuts are grown in tropical areas, there's a lot of metals in the soil, some um, elements do come into the, the nut itself, and some are more radioactive than others. So, all right, nice. I got two more items for us, and I'm sure all of you guys love these. Yellow bananas, oops, hold on. <laughs> are bananas radioactive? Okay. All right, we got a very smart audience here. So bananas do have some radioactivity because there's a lot of potassium. Potassium-40 does emit a little bit of radiation. Very good. Our last one here, audience, Geiger audience here. Um, does water emit some radiation? What do you think? Light? Okay, this is a tricky one. No, there is no radiation in water. Um, 
But as you can see, these are everyday items. The amount of radiation that's emitted is negligible. It's not harmful. Um, yeah, so thank you. Now, we'd like to go to YouTube, and I want you guys to uh, reflect back on how radiation is made in um, elements, and what kind of practical uses does radiation have uh, for us. Thank you. It is only in the last 100 or so years that humankind has understood that the nucleus of the chemical elements is not always fixed. It can change spontaneously from one element to another. The name for this process is radioactivity. You probably already know something about the nucleus. It's much tinier than the atom. It's made of particles called protons and neutrons. There are electrons orbiting around it. And though the atoms can share or swap electrons when they bond together, the nuclei themselves never change. Right? Well, no. Certain nuclei are not stable in that way. This means they may change suddenly, spontaneously. The radioactive nucleus flings out a small particle and transforms into another element, just like that. For example, a carbon nucleus can eject a fast-moving electron and turn into a nitrogen nucleus. There are two different particles that can be emitted from radioactive nuclei, though never together. The very fast electron is known as a beta particle. If you know a little bit about electrons, you may be thinking, what was the electron doing in the nucleus in the first place? The answer is that a neutron in the nucleus spontaneously changed into a proton, which stayed behind, and an electron flew out as a beta particle. This is not what chemistry has taught us to expect. The nucleus is supposed to be stable. Neutrons don't change into protons, except sometimes they do. The other particle that emits spontaneously from an unstable nucleus is alpha. An alpha particle is 8,000 times more massive than beta, and it's a bit slower. Alpha is made from two protons and two neutrons. If we trap a lot of alpha particles together, we get helium gas. Alpha is a helium nucleus. Like the beta particle, we would not have expected a heavier nucleus to throw out helium. But again, it happens, and the nucleus becomes a new element. So, is radioactivity useful or just dangerous? Wherever you are sitting, it is quite likely that there is a device nearby which contains a source of alpha particles, a smoke detector. The source is radioactive americium. You are totally safe from these alpha particles, which cannot travel more than a few centimetres in air. Beta particles penetrate much further through materials than alpha can. Radioactive atoms are used in medicine as tracers, to show where chemicals travel in the patient. Beta particles are emitted and have enough energy to emerge from the body and be detected. There is a third type of nuclear radiation, gamma, which is not a particle at all. It is an electromagnetic wave, like microwaves or light but it is actually a thousand times more energetic than visible light. Gamma rays may pass right through your body. Gamma is used to zap the bacteria in fruit to increase its shelf life, or in radiotherapy to kill cancer cells. Radioactive substances get hot, and this heat can be used to generate power. This heat has been put to use in space probes and, in the past, in pacemakers for hearts. The more abruptly nuclear radiation is slowed down, the more damage it does to the atoms it hits. This is called ionisation. Alpha causes the most ionisation as it crashes into other atoms, and gamma the least. For humans, the most serious effect of radiation is the damage that it can cause to our DNA. Although alpha cannot penetrate your skin, if you inhale or ingest a radioactive nucleus, the health consequences can be severe. Radioactivity is both useful and deadly, but it is all around us as a background to the natural world. All right, thank you, Kathy. So one thing to take away from that video is that all of the helium that we use in our helium balloons is actually the result of alpha decay that is occurring in the soil from natural products. So um, we wouldn't have helium balloons if it wasn't for alpha decay. So now that you know something about isotopes and radioactivity, let me get back to the question I posed earlier, which is how much farther could the periodic table go? Well, this is a map that Professor Seaborg in the late 60s had one of his students draw to demonstrate the number of protons and neutrons in the most stable nuclei. Protons are going along the vertical axis and neutrons are horizontal. 
and the piece of land that's sticking out represents the stable isotopes. Anything that's on either side would be radioactive. Now by this time, nuclear scientists knew that there were certain numbers of protons and neutrons that were especially stable. Not just that they like to be paired up or have even numbers, which they did, but there were certain numbers that the nucleus kept trying to get to. And if they were too far from one of these, it would make them very unstable. These are the so-called magic numbers, and those are the numbers listed on the two axes here. Now, lead is a magic nucleus. It has 82 protons, and it is the last naturally occurring magic uh, nucleus. After we pass by lead, we get to the actinides and pass the actinides to element 104, but everything now is radioactive, and that's because we're moving farther and farther away from the so-called magic number at 82. So the question was, are we done with the periodic table? As we move past 82, are we just going to get to shorter and shorter until everything ends abruptly? But again, nature likes to repeat itself all the time. And so nuclear theorists started to think about what could the next magic number of protons be? And if we could get there and have the right number of neutrons, could we even make something in the lab that was so long lived it might last for thousands or tens of thousands of years. In fact, scientists even went searching for element 114 in ore deposits and oceanic deposits. But we know now that their estimates of half-life were way off and were not anywhere that long. But here would be element 114 in our map. And this is what started to drive the push for the quest for super heavy elements. Now, these are the super heavy elements uh, outlined in red, starting with 104 and ending with 118. So how do I make them? Now I'm going to tell you the recipe for making a super heavy element. Now I told you that if we want to have an element of a certain number, we need to have that many protons in the nucleus. So we need to add up protons. For instance, if we start with calcium, same calcium in your teeth and your nails, that's element 20 and it has 20 protons in the center. Now let's say we could take a calcium and we could combine it with another element, say curium, number 96, down here in the actinides. If we add up 20 and 96 and we could push them together and get all their protons to combine, we would have 116 protons, which conveniently is element 116 or livermorium, as you know. Now, if it was just that easy, I would have a jar up here of calcium and a jar of curium and I would shake them together and I would hand each and every one of you an element 116 and accept that it would be gone one second after you got it, you could say you left here with an element 116 in your hand. Well, obviously, because I don't have any jars, it's not quite that easy. And here's why. Both the calcium and the curium have protons in the middle. Now, if you've ever played with magnets and you've tried to take the two positive ends and put them together, you know what happens. They immediately repel apart. Same thing here. I have a positive calcium and I have a positive curium. And if I want to bring them together, they just also repel apart. The only way I can get calcium and curium to join together so that all their protons are, are in one element is to have the calcium coming in so fast, fraction of the speed of light, with so much energy that it overcomes this repulsive force and bashes into the curium and they fuse together. So how do we do that? With an instrument called a cyclotron, shown here on the left. A cyclotron is a big instrument that first has a large vacuum chamber, and if we could look inside, you would see on the cartoon on the right, two D-shaped magnets facing one another. So let's take our calcium. If we put it in the middle of these magnets, and we then apply an alternating voltage on them, what happens is the calcium is positive, and as we alternate voltage, it's accelerated toward the opposite charge and repels away from the, from the like charge. And it keeps doing that over and over again until it starts to spin faster and faster. If we get it going fast enough, it will exit the cyclotron with enough energy that it can then smash into a target, in this case, our curium example. And if that happens, we have a chance to make a heavy element. Now, cyclotrons are pretty big. These are our colleagues at the Flare-Off Lab for Nuclear Reactions, which is in Dubna, Russia. And we've had the privilege of working with them since the late 80s. They have one of the most powerful cyclotrons in the world. And what determines how fast those particles come out is actually the size of the cyclotron. This one's about 13 feet across. The largest one sits at Triumph, which is at the University of British Columbia. That one is 56 feet across. 
But the first cyclotron that was invented by Ernest Lawrence at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, named after him, was only about four inches. So you can see things have changed a lot since then. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy, who's going to talk to you more about cyclotrons. OK, I am back. So what I have here is a miniature cyclotron. Um, I literally YouTubed it, and it gave me instructions on how to make it. So let me explain this. Um, this device in the back here is called a Wimhurst machine. And what this does is it generates high voltage. So as I spin um, the Wimhurst, there are two disks that basically allow that voltage to go into these two rods. Now it separates. Um, this side is separating with uh, cations, which is positively charged. And then this side has negatively charged. And they're both connected to electrodes in the bowl. Now I want you to imagine that the bowl is the cyclotron and the metal ball inside is the calcium. Remember, we really want to accelerate this particle so we can launch it to the target. So let me try this out real quick. Let me charge it. See if it'll go on its own. It's moving. There you go. All right, so the reason the ball is able to move is because as it goes over the electrode, it actually charges to that same charge. So as it moves over the red electrode, it becomes positively charged. And because positively charged items with positively charged materials repel each other, it launches it to the next portion of the cyclotron. So you can see it's still going, and then as I keep moving it around, it goes a little faster and it'll go on until the charge dissipates. So that's how a cyclotron works. Still going. <laughs> that is really amazing. I just love that. <laughs> OK, now we're continuing our recipe for how to make a heavy element. So you've just seen how we accelerate our calcium to a fraction of the speed of light. Now we need a target. And we can use other materials, not just curium. This is just an example I wanted to give you. Uh, curium is a man-made element, too, discovered in Berkeley. Uh, but it, the difference is its half-life is long enough that we can actually collect enough of it to make a target. And you can see in the center picture the actual target that was used in the discovery of Livermorium. Now, Curium is named after Marie Curie, who's a very interesting figure in science. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, the first person to win two Nobel Prizes in two different fields, one in physics and one in chemistry. She also was the first person to use mobile x-ray units during World War I to help wounded soldiers in the field. So if you ever need a biography, hers is fascinating. I really recommend it. But here we have our target. In this case, it's curium. And we've slammed our calcium into our curium very hard with a lot of energy. Now, the Super Bowl being tomorrow, I'm sure you understand what happens if somebody holds that football, just like in the Peanuts movie, and someone comes and kicks it, the football goes flying because of conservation of momentum. That's what happens in our experiment, too. The calcium's coming in with such high energy that it hits the target, and a bunch of particles fly out the back. What particles? Well, a lot of the beam does not really do anything, so we get all of those particles coming out. We also get cases where the calcium doesn't really hit a curium. They just kind of graze one another and fly apart, so those particles come out. But every so often, if a calcium and a curium hit each other dead on, head to head, they might fuse together and form a 116 nucleus. And those get kicked out too. So how do we find that 1116? We use a separator, which is a series of magnets that's specially tuned so that our small beam particles get deflected away and our heavy element goes straight through. Now we've made our heavy element and we've separated it from all this other background stuff we don't want. So how do we know we have it? We use a detector, which is shown on the right. It's a shoebox, basically, that is made up of strips of silicon semiconductors, the same ones that were made down in Silicon Valley. The heavy element hits one of those silicon detectors, and it sits there. And we get an electrical signal from the semiconductor to a computer. Now, I told you that everything past uranium is radioactive. So that means very soon after we make it, this element's going to undergo radioactive decay. And every time it does, we get an electrical signal from the detector. So what we have at the end are a whole bunch of signals coming from one atom of element 116, or whatever we've been looking for. But what does it look like? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't look like anything here. This is my favorite version of the periodic table, because I love the real world examples, when there can be one, for all of the naturally occurring elements. But now think back to our helium and gold examples. 
We needed three sextillion atoms of gold just to make a teeny little one gram bar that you could hold in your hand. So now I have one atom of a heavy element. So I can't weigh it, and I can't touch it, and I can't see it, and it's radioactive. And just like the video showed, you shouldn't eat radioactivity or anything like that, so I won't say taste it. But how do I know that I have it? Well, this is what heavy element data looks like, that table of numbers on the right, except much longer, going on and on and on for a lot of pages. Every time we get a signal in that detector, we get a row of numbers here. Now, our separator's pretty good, but unfortunately, it's not 100%. So that means a whole bunch of other particles are hitting our detector, too, and they give us a signal. So what do we do with this? Well, thankfully, we have some of the world's fastest supercomputers at the Livermore Lab, and we can write codes to tell the computer to go searching for a heavy element. So what are we looking for? The element hits our detector, and it stays in one place. We're looking for something that never moves out of that spot, but undergoes a series of radioactive decays. In other words, something that looks like this, these series of blue squares. What you're looking at is an actual data piece from the discovery of element 117. The top one is the 117 atom hitting our detector. And then the subsequent blue squares are all of its radioactive decays that it underwent. If we see something like this, it also has the right half-life, because we know these things are very short-lived. So if these all line up in the same spot in the detector with the right half-life, then we can wave our flag and say, yippee, we have discovered an atom of a super heavy element. So here's the recipe again for a heavy element in cartoon form. We need a beam of something, in this case calcium, and we need to make it go really, really fast so we can overcome that repulsion between protons in the two atoms. Then we need a target of something, in this case curium, and we need to slam them together and collect all of their protons in one place. That's called a compound nucleus. And as you see, it's not very happy because the calcium has hit it so hard, it has a lot of extra energy. So then what it does is it spits out a few neutrons, those same particles, and it comes down a little bit and it's a little more stable, and then we can detect it. But it doesn't stick around very long, probably on order of seconds or less. Now these experiments are very difficult and they have a low probability. The last one of these talks, you're gonna hear about statistics, and the statistics here are very small. We have to start with 10 to the 18 zeros after it, calcium atoms, to get one to three heavy elements over the course of three months. And sometimes we get zero, it's the way it goes. But every so often, if we're lucky, we might get one, two, or three, and then we can say that we've discovered a new element. So this video does a nice job of showing you what I just said in words. If we could look at the atom scale of the beams and targets, this might be what's going on. The discovery of element 116 took place in the year 2000. A target made of the element curium is emplaced in the U-400 cyclotron at the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, Flareov Laboratory of Nuclear Reactions in Dubna, Russia. Calcium ions are accelerated at high velocity toward the target of curium atoms. The calcium ions bombard the radioactive curium target in the first experiment for about 90 days. As they approach the target, only one of billions fuses with the target to create element 116. At this point, the newly created element 116 travels through a separator and stops in a detector. A total of about 30 atoms of element 116 have been produced at Dubna, and several atoms of element 116 have been produced at GSI in Darmstadt, Germany. At the detector, element 116 decays to heavy element 114, to heavy element 112, and so on. Finally, the nucleus fissions, ultimately splitting into two lighter elements. In May of 2012, culminating over a decade of research, element 116 was named Livermorium, honoring the many U.S. scientists involved in nuclear chemistry and super-heavy element research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and the city of Livermore. Element 114 was named Flerovium, honoring the Flerov Laboratory of Nuclear Reactions and its namesake, Gheorghe Flerov. 
Now, this is only done in a few places around the world because we do need a very large cyclotron to pull this off. So these are the labs that have discovered super heavy elements, starting with uh, the Lawrence Berkeley lab down the road, who did the lion's share, especially of the early work. Moving on to the GSI lab in Germany, Riken in Japan has just recently been granted element 113, and then our collaboration with Dubna uh, has done elements 114 through 118. Now, I told you earlier that not all of the elements have names yet. Well, that's because there's some rules that an organization called the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry has said we need to do in order to name a new element. That's the organization that determines all things chemical in the world, whether it's molecule names or drug compounds, any of these things. The first thing that has to happen is one of these other labs has to repeat the same experiment and get the same answer. Now, I just told you the probability here is very small. We might make one atom in three months. So we're asking somebody else to put aside their own experiments and try to repeat what we did. Well, luckily, this community is, is pretty close-knit, and in general, we try to help each other out. So we're very fortunate that that happens. But even then, the scientists get to propose names, but they have to be vetted because you know, maybe it's used as a physical constant in another area of science, or maybe there'd be confusion with some other symbol. And this process can literally take decades from the time that an element is discovered, which is why we have four elements that still don't have names. And there are some rules. Like, for instance, it could be named after a famous scientist or a location that has significance or even a mythological creature. Um, but I'm sorry, I have to say that the lead singer of heavy metal bands are not considered mythological creatures. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to Google and type in lemium, and you'll, you'll see all about it. But as you heard in the video, we got to name a couple of elements a few years ago, which was extremely exciting. And just for note, because we're only a couple blocks away, if after this you wander down to the corner of First Street and Livermore Avenue, you'll see that park with the tree across from the comic book store. That is actually officially Livermorium Plaza. And in a weird twist of fate, the address of that park, seriously, is 116 South Livermore Avenue. So the next time you're down there getting your coffee, go take a look at the benches that some of our local students have painted in order to honor Livermorium. And at some point, there's supposed to be some kind of uh, piece of art or monument there to celebrate Livermorium being named after our city. Now, New Year's Eve, I got a call from IUPAC at home in the morning while I was still wearing my pajamas, telling me, true story, that the rest of the elements have been granted discovery rights and that Japan is going to get to name Element 113, and Livermore Dubna, along with our colleagues from the Oak Ridge Lab in Tennessee, are going to get to name 115, 117, and 118. And indeed, in a couple of weeks, we will all start the process of trying to come up with names for these elements. And then I can tell you that Elements 1 through 118 will have official and final names, and your periodic table will be complete at that point. Yay. Thank you, yes, yes. But does that mean we're done with heavy element science? Not at all, of course. Now, I'm a chemist by training, so this is where I have to start talking about chemistry, because I can't give a talk without chemistry in it. So I told you earlier that the periodic table is a roadmap to chemistry. And in fact, we can use it to predict the chemical properties of the super heavy elements. Is that even possible, being that elements 1 to 92, we need 10 to the 23rd of them to be able to weigh them or see where they melt or see how they boil. So what do we do with a single atom? Well, believe it or not, we've done chemistry on elements 104 to 108. That's because their half-lives are on order of seconds to minutes, so that's actually enough time to do a chemical separation. So what we can do is create one of these elements, put it in some kind of solution, mix it with another solution, and see where the heavy element goes. That's how we can determine its chemistry. And I can tell you that for the most part, with a few exceptions, the chemistry of 104 to 108 is pretty ordinary in that they line up with their transition metal neighbors there in the center of the periodic table. But it's a little bit different once we get to 109 because the half-lives now are getting much shorter. We're talking second or less. Well, that makes it very difficult to do a chemical separation. But we are actually thinking of ways right now on how to do that. Very quickly, I want to talk about fluorovium, which is element 114. Fluorovium, right now, is the hot topic of interest in heavy element chemistry around the world. 
That's because of where it sits in the periodic table, which is right below lead. Now, based on what I've told you earlier, you should be thinking, well, duh, if it's well below lead, it's gonna be metallic like lead, except that maybe it won't. That's because, as I told you earlier, 114 is predicted to be a heavy, sorry, a magic nucleus. And that means it would be particularly stable. And chemical theorists think if that's true, and it is a magic nucleus, that it will actually change the structure of the whole atom, not just the nucleus. And that will change its chemistry. So there are some people that are predicting that fluorovium will act like a noble gas. But wait, I just told you that the noble gases are all the way to the right, and any noble gas has to sit in that right-hand column. Well, that's the tricky part here. If fluorovium is actually a noble gas, we have to rethink the way that we've outlined the last row of the periodic table. Well, before you panic and throw out your periodic tables yet, these experiments are in process and they're very challenging, so we don't have any new periodic tables for you yet. But this is really gonna change the landscape of how we think about chemistry when we get to these super heavies. So how do we do chemistry on a single atom? Well, if we have enough half-life, meaning like a minute, we used to do it the old-fashioned way, graduate students. <laughs> what we did, literally, is we would make element 104 or 105 at the cyclotron. I was at the 88 inch at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And we would stand there, and we would put it in a solution and add a solution, and we would do this over and over, once a minute, every minute, for eight hours at a time, for weeks and weeks and weeks, until we could say what the chemistry of these elements was. And as I told you before, we found out they're pretty ordinary in terms of where they sit in the transition metals. But with two second half-life, fluorovium, the longest isotope that lives, is two seconds. No graduate student is even that good. <laughs> so we have to rethink how we're gonna do chemistry. And this is where things like robotics may come into play. Can we actually design an instrument and a robot that does chemistry faster than a human being? Well, we don't know yet. That's where you guys are gonna come in. You're gonna be the ones that are gonna answer that question for me in the next 10 years. We also can think about new ways to do chemistry. Instead of just putting it in a solution and mixing it together in your traditional, uh, what we used to call beaker clinking, what if we use different molecules? So these are examples of molecules that just so happen to form a structure that makes a ring, just because of the way the elements are put together. And in the middle of that ring is a space. If we can pick just the right one, it might be the right size for an element 114 to sit in the middle. And if that happens, it would be very selective and very fast. Now next week you're gonna be hearing about microchips and how they're used for analysis. And I think they have application here too. Because I could take a small microchip and load it with some of these molecules and then flow my element 114 over it and instantaneously, perhaps, I could pull my 114 out and say something about its chemistry before it decays. This is actually a project that we've been working on for a few years. This is a postdoc, his name is John Despotopoulos, and he is trying to come up with new ways to do chemistry on the super heavy elements. So now, where do we go from here? Probably one of the first questions I always get is, where's element 119, where's 120? Nobody's satisfied, you want more and more, I understand. So that's a good question. So I told you that back in the late 60s, Glenn Seaborg and his colleagues, colleagues thought element 114 was gonna be this magic nucleus with a very long half-life. Well, to be fair, we're not quite there because we don't have as many neutrons as we really need. We're still about 10 neutrons short. But we are down to two seconds for the longest 114. And once we move beyond that magic island, it gets shorter and shorter till we get to 118, which lives less than one millisecond. That's less than one thousandth of a second. So we have a few problems as we move ahead. And yes, the answer is we are trying to move ahead and find the new elements, but there's some challenges ahead of us. First of all, as I just said, the half-lives are getting shorter and shorter. So we can detect things right now on the scale of milliseconds. But if things get much more short than that, I'm afraid our electronics are just not gonna keep up. So we may actually produce a new element but it'll be gone before our electronics have a chance to record its signal. That means we need new kinds of electronics and new kinds of detectors that all of you can help develop for us. Then there's that probability problem. 
it gets even worse the higher up we go because while we're trying to bring our two positive nuclei together, we have more and more protons in the system as we go higher and higher. It just gets more difficult to have them slam together and fuse. Then there's materials. We always use calcium as our beam and just change what target we want depending on the element we're making. But we've run out basically of combinations where we can use calcium and a target. That means we need new types of beams. And our colleagues at Oak Ridge Lab are actually working on that right now. So what is the future that all of you are gonna work on for me and solve? So we need more intense cyclotrons so that our beams come out with even more energy. And our colleagues in Russia are building one right now that's supposed to be the most powerful cyclotron in the world when they're finished. And then we need new beams, for instance, titanium compounds are what Oak Ridge is working on. And then we need new types of detectors and new electronics that can keep up with these ever shortening half-lives. And then there's chemistry. To me, this is so exciting because this is completely wide open. The chemistry of so many of these is a huge question mark right now. So we have to think of new methods like chemistry on a chip, making new molecules, and yes, perhaps even automation in robots. And I'm hoping that some of you will be able to tell me in the next 10 to 20 years how to solve this problem because I gotta tell you, it's pretty tricky. So this is the team an enormous number of people that go into these experiments. The lion's share of credit goes to our colleagues in Russia who keep that cyclotron going 24 seven for months at a time. And then we at Livermore have done independent data analysis for these experiments and we're also working on heavy element chemistry. Our colleagues at Oak Ridge have provided a lot of target material and they're working on new beam methods. And then we also try to have university partners because it's really important that we train the next generation of nuclear scientists, that's all of you, to help us solve some of these problems in the future. And with that, I wanna thank you all very much. <laughs>